Hi, everybody. We're going to get started with the webinar now. This is Tips and Tricks for Customer Segmentation. My name is Caitlin Montink, and I am a marketing statistician here at Salford Systems. Salford Systems is a data mining and predictive analytics software company. And for those of you who may not be able to devote your full attention today or have colleagues that would like to see the webinar at another time, you'll be receiving a follow-up email at some point tomorrow with a recording of the webinar, a copy of the slides, the data set I'll be using in the demonstration, a tutorial with step-by-step -step instructions on how to replicate the analysis, and instructions on how to download our 30-day evaluation of the software. So a quick outline of what we'll be going over today. We'll talk about what customer segmentation is. Then I'll introduce the German credit problem, which is the data that we'll be looking at. Talk a little bit about CART, which is classification and regression trees and some different parameters that we can control to optimize your customer segmentation. And then we'll go a little bit further with optimization and look at TreeNet, a stochastic gradient boosting engine in our software that could really boost the accuracy of your segmentation. And then I'll go over some automation techniques to bring your model to the next level. We'll also look at some case studies, insurance policy renewals, and health club memberships that also illustrate customer segmentation. And if we have time, we'll do a Q&A at the end. So submit your questions through the questions pane. And if I can answer them at the end, I will do that. And if I don't get to that, we will send answers to you by the end of the day. OK, so the definition of customer segmentation it's pretty broad. It's basically just dividing your database into distinct groups of individuals who share common characteristics. You need to identify key differentiators of your individuals in the database, such as demographic, geographic, psychographic, or behavioral. These are the differentiators that you will use to separate your database into different groups. And the benefits of segmenting your customers is being able to apply marketing strategies that target specific customers or specific groups. You won't be exhausting all of your resources to target every group if you know specifically which ones to send an email to or send mail mail to. Another benefit is generating maximum profit from each group. You can also adjust your marketing strategies over time as behavior changes, just updating a customer segmentation model can change your segmentation based on whether someone changes their credit history or if they open a new credit card. And we'll be looking at financial data today. And then finally, I just listed two approaches. These aren't necessarily concrete approaches in customer segmentation. They're just two different ways to look at the problem that I'll be illustrating today. The first is pre-segmentation. So this is the most common. This is if you have a database and you're looking to divide it. And then post-segmentation, the health club membership problem that we'll be looking at um, is a database that has already been divided into 10 groups. And we're going to look into those groups and see how they were divided. So it's a little bit different of an approach. The problem we'll be looking at is the German credit problem. This is a database on the UCI machine learning repository. I have the link here. Many of you may know about this repository. There are a lot of good data sets to look through. Our task is to predict whether a customer is a good or a bad credit risk. The data set has 1,000 records, so not a huge data set. But we do have 20 characteristics of each customer that we are going to use to segment our database and predict whether they'll be a good or bad credit risk. This is a typical financial application. Our key task, obviously, this is customer segmentation webinar, so we'll be defining distinct segments of the customers based on the attributes and extracting rules for each of these groups. And you'll see exactly what the rules mean later. We also want to decrease our false good customers rate. And what this means is that 
In this application, it is much worse to classify a bad customer as good than to classify a good customer as bad. You want to catch all of the bad credit risks at the sacrifice of some of the good credit risks. And so this is one of the control parameters that we'll be looking at in the software so that you can set up your model correctly. Finally, we'll be optimizing our segmentation, segmentation with some advanced techniques. This is a sample of what our data set looks like. As I mentioned, there are 1,000 records and 20 characteristics, so this is just a small snapshot. We have variables such as age of the customer, housing type, how many credit lines they have open, whether they have a telephone, whether they're a foreign worker. Other variables not shown here include credit history, credit amount, savings account, if they have a checking account, and notice that there is a mix of categorical and numeric variables here, but our software can handle both of these. We won't have to do any recoding. There are also no missing values in this data set, but if there were, we wouldn't have to worry about them because the software does handle those as well. The variable all the way to the right in this chart is called type. This is the type of customer. So type 1 is a good credit risk, and type 2 is a bad credit risk. Other variables, um, the full definitions can be found on the UCI website. I won't go through every single one of them. OK, so let's start with our tip 1 for customer segmentation. Our tip 1 is the use cart. And this might seem obvious, but there are other methods that people would typically start with during customer segmentation. And we're, we encourage you to try CART. Classification regression trees can be an extremely powerful method. It separates relevant from irrelevant predictors automatically. The results that you get from a CART tree are simple, easy to understand. To the right here is a picture of a CART tree. You start with all your data, and you simply partition based on some of the attributes. It doesn't require any variable transformations by the analyst. You don't have to do them by hand, as you would in a logistic regression. And CART is impervious to outliers and missing values. As I mentioned before, missing values aren't a problem to put into the software. CART has been around since the early 80s, and it's become known as the fastest, most versatile predictive modeling algorithm available to analysts. It's the foundation to modern data mining techniques, uh, boosting, which we'll be looking at today, and bagging. And data partitioning um, in a decision tree such as this creates distinct groups of records. So you don't have to use any specific clustering methods. It kind of just makes clusters on its own. CART is also good for both continuous and categorical target variables. As I mentioned before, some other methods can be used here, such as neural nets, k-nearest neighbors, logistic regression, and discriminant analysis. However, I did stumble across a paper, which is referenced on the last slide of the PowerPoint that compared all of these methods on this exact data set we'll be looking at today. And CART was described as extremely easy to use, having a sophisticated and automatic pruning method. Again, everything in CART, almost everything is done automatically for you. And this is a huge advantage. CART also produces smaller trees, which is convenient. And CART seem to be the best in terms of accuracy on this data set and on other data sets in the repository. Of course, CART does have some disadvantages. There are sharp decision boundaries in the decision tree. It tends to evolve around the strongest effects in your model, and it has difficulty capturing global linear patterns. But all in all, for customer segmentation, we find CART to be extremely useful to get a first insight on your customers and the groups you want to make from your database.
Okay, so this slide is building a cart model. So I will switch over to the software and we will build our first cart model on the German credit database. So what you see on the screen here is our Salford Predictive Modeler, version 7, we call it SPM. This is our GUI interface. We also have it in a non-GUI form for those of you who would like to code manually. This window here is our classic output. All report contents will be printed here, results of your model. And you can also type commands in at this command prompt. Now I'll go ahead and open up our data file. There's a little folder shortcut here at the top left. It brings up a dialog box where you can locate the data file. Here I have it as german underscore credit dot csv. And I'll just point out here in this drop down menu, files of type, our software supports many different files to import. Once I click open, we get an activity window. And this will show you the data that you just imported. It'll tell you how many records you have. We have 1,000 records, 22 total variables. And those variables will be listed here on the left. It's a good way to see that your data set imported correctly. Additionally, at the bottom of the activity window, we have a list of buttons where you can create frequency distributions of your variables, descriptive statistics, view your data, do some simple data prep, set some engine options, score your data, or build a model. We'll be looking at a few of these, but first I'll click View Data. This just gives you a spreadsheet of the data set. You can take a quick look at the variables, see what you have, make sure everything went in correctly and that you don't see any missing values or red flags. I'll go back to the activity window. We have a shortcut for that as well. And now I'll click Stats. We're going to run some descriptive statistics on our variables. All variables are automatically included. And we want to make sure that Detailed Stats and Tables is selected so we can get full details on each variable. When I click OK, we get a brief view of each variable. Each variable it has its own row with statistics such as number of records, percent missing, mean, min, max, and some quantiles. Additionally, we can switch to full view in the upper right. And this gives you even more information about each variable. What I wanted to show you here is if we scroll over, to our last variable, type of customer. This is our target. If we scroll down and expand frequency tables, we can see that the percentage of good customers, good credit risks in the data set is 70%, and bad customers is 30%. So we're just getting an idea of how the two classes are distributed in the data. Okay, so we'll start building our cart model now. I'll click our model setup window. We have a shortcut here, a little blue and yellow web. Our model setup is the same for each of our engines in the software. All you have to do is change the analysis method in the bottom right. So I'll choose cart because that's what we'll be looking at first. Up here we have analysis type. This is where you choose whether your target is categorical or continuous. So we're classifying whether a customer is good or bad. So we'll be doing classification. In the left here we select our variables. In the target column I'll pick type of customer and select all of the remaining variables as predictors. One more tab we'll look at quickly here is the testing tab. Whenever you build a model, you want to test how well it performs on a separate set of data. Sometimes we set aside an entire fraction of data for testing, but since we only have a thousand records here, 
We'll be using the default testing method for CARP, which is tenfold cross-validation. And what this means is that we separate our data set into ten equal parts, and we build the model on nine of the parts and test on the tenth. And we do this for each fold. Okay, so now I'll click Start in the bottom right corner to build the model. This is our CART Navigator window. Again, with the GUI interface, it's easy to see and visualize, easy to understand and explain to somebody. In the top half here, we have our optimal CART tree. The green nodes are what we call parent nodes. And the red and blue nodes are terminal nodes, which could also be seen as segments. And they are color-coded based on the concentration of either good or bad credit risk, good being the blue and red being the bad. In the bottom half here, we have our model sequence. So as the tree grew bigger and bigger, we can show you, you start with a small tree, and this data kept partitioning. And this green vertical bar here is our optimal model with a relative cost of 0.58. Now this is just our first CART model. We haven't yet optimized the control parameters. So I'll just quickly go over the summary of the model. We have a summary button here at the bottom. We'll be looking at ROC, which is area under the ROC curve, for on our test sample. So we've got, a, got about 0.72 here, which isn't bad. Next, we want to look at our prediction success table. This tab up here, prediction success, holds what is also called a confusion matrix. And this shows how well our model is predicting in each of our classes. So this table can be a little confusing. There are a lot of numbers. But the number we'll be focusing on here, I've highlighted, is 83. This is the rate that we want to decrease in this problem. What this means is that there were 83 bad credit risks that were classified as good credit risks. So the model myth is that these people are not good people to give a credit card to. And we want to decrease this number as much as possible. So in this case, we won't be looking at overall percent correct in class accuracy. We're actually just trying to increase the accuracy in predicting bad credit risk. And that is problem specific. It depends on what you're trying to predict and which class is more important to you. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slide so we can talk about how to adjust our CART model. Okay, tip two is to determine priors and costs. In our problem, as I mentioned before, identifying customers of one class is more important to us than identifying the other class. And this is typically the case, and this is when we need to adjust our CART parameters. And in this case, particularly, the UCI repository actually provided a cost matrix for us. They told us that it's about five times worse to classify a bad customer as good than the other way around. And the way that we implement this in the software is via a cost matrix. So the cost matrix is pictured here, and we have a 5 in the bottom left cell. What this means is that we are imposing a cost of 5 times as much when you're classifying a bad customer as good than the other way around. And what this does is it forces the model to work harder to classify that costlier event. So that's how cost was working here. And priors are another control parameter that works in conjunction with cost. So they're also called within known probabilities. And the next two slides will hopefully help you understand how priors and costs are working a little bit better. So 
these priors and costs are actually fundamental controls in CART. They make profound implications for all of the stages of tree development and evaluation. They lie at the core of our successful model building techniques. And this is a little illustration of how priors and costs actually affect your model. You start with a population that you want to learn about. In this case, it's customers or potential customers of the bank. And you have a data set drawn from that population that you want to feed into a data mining engine to eventually come up with a model. Now, in order to come up with this model, you have to feed the engine with priors and costs. CART cannot run without these parameters. Our first CART run that I just showed you in the software has default values for costs and priors. So we didn't put them in there, but they are behind the scenes as default values. But we'll be looking at changing those to get the best model possible. So the priors come from the population. These are probabilities for each class, and the costs are imposed by the analyst to somewhat offset the priors. So another illustration of exactly how these priors and costs work. Say we have two overlapping classes. So we have a red class and a blue class here. We have three vertical lines in this plot that show three different trees or three different sets of priors. So these are just one split trees. This is the root node split that it's signifying. So for example, the default value for priors in CART is 0.5 for one class and 0.5 for the other. This is called priors equal. So what this is doing here the medium gray line right in the middle, is it's trying to trade off between class accuracy and class purity. So it's kind of in the middle. It's getting most of the blues and most of the reds. However, if you start shifting those priors towards one class or the other, you'll notice that you are sacrificing some of the accuracy in one class. For example, if you shift the priors to the left, the black line, you're putting a higher prior on the blue class. So you're sacrificing some of the red classification to capture all of the blue. And vice versa, if you have a prior of 0.9 on the red class, you're capturing most of that at the sacrifice of some of the blue class. So varying priors, as I said, is an effective control over trading off between purity and accuracy in a given class. And then cost is just another mechanism that goes hand in hand with priors to trade off weighting false positives and false negative rates. So this sounds really complicated, and we really could spend probably an entire day explaining priors and costs. But for this purpose, just know that they are numbers that you will have to play around with depending on your data. We do have some automation techniques in the software. We have something called a battery. And what this does is it actually varies the priors for you and rebuilds the model on several different sets of priors. And that way you can look at the models back to back to see how changing the priors actually affects your performance and your class accuracy. So now that we learned about our first two parameters, cost and priors, I'll go back to the software and we'll change those two in our CART model. So back to SPM, I'll minimize our first CART model and we'll go back to model setup. So we still have our settings here from the last model. Now what we'll do is we'll look at the cost tab. When you click this tab in CART, you will see the cost matrix. And this is where you just fill in the numbers. So as you remember from the slides, the bottom left cell, we'll put in five. We also have our priors tab. As I mentioned before, the default is that the priors are equal. All categories have equal probability. 
but here we don't want this to be the case. We know that one of our classes is much smaller than the other, and we want to do a better job at classifying those bad credit risks. So instead, we'll choose data. And what this does is it matches those within node probabilities to the sample frequencies. In this case, since we're using cross-validation, the learn, test, and data options are all equal to each other. So you will get the same model picking any of those three because you're using the entire sample as learn and the entire sample as test when you do cross-validation. Okay, so before we run this model, I'll go back to the slides and we'll talk about one more parameter. We want to optimize our model all at once here for time-saving purposes. Obviously, in a typical situation when you're analyzing the model, you might have to go back and change these a couple times to get the model you want. Okay, so tip three is you want to decide on your segment size. In our first CART model that we built, some of the terminal nodes in the tree had as few as 11 records. So we had groups of customers that were only 11 people in a data set of 1,000. Now this might be all right for you, but sometimes if you have the settings on the default, you could have a terminal node with one customer. And having a segment of one customer isn't really telling you anything about your database. And so you as the analyst have control over the size of the segment. And you want to impose limits on the ter parent and terminal nodes to control the size of the tree. So here, I just have a screenshot in the software of the settings that we'll be imposing on the second CART model. And I'll explain what these mean. In parent node minimum cases, we've entered 50. And what this means is that you, a node cannot be split any further unless it contains at least 50 records. This way, you're not splitting a node that only has 30 or less. The second parameter is terminal node minimum cases, which we have set at 20. And so this means that a terminal node cannot be created from a split unless it holds at least 20 records. So this is the number that you'll be setting your segment size. So if you want to have segments with at least 50 people, you'll put 50 in terminal node minimum cases. And then you adjust the parent node. Accordingly, we usually say maybe about a 3 to 1 ratio. We also have automation for these numbers as well. When you build your first CART model, you might not know what numbers to enter here. So we do have a battery that varies these numbers. And you can see how that affects your model. Again, these are completely problem and user specific. So it will be something that you kind of have to play with. So back to the software. This is found in our Limits tab. Up here in the upper left is the picture I showed you. All I'll do is change this 50 and 20. 50 and 20 is just one example that works for this problem, but that doesn't mean it's the only setting that will work. OK, so we'll set everything here, and I'll click Start to run the model. So again, we have our optimal tree in the top half and our model sequence in the bottom half. If you hover over the nodes in the tree, you'll see that all of the terminal nodes, which are blue and red, have at least 20 cases in them by that n equals number at the bottom left of the window that pops up. I'll also point out down here in the model sequence, our relative cost is significantly higher than the cost that we got on the last model. Now, since we played with the cost matrix and we fiddled with the two parameters, they're not completely compatible anymore. So we can't compare this relative cost number to the last model that we got. Instead, we'll be comparing by the area under the ROC curve. So again, to see that, we'll click the summary button.
here we're getting about 0.71 area under the ROC curve on the test sample. This is about the same as our last model. We'll look again at the prediction success table. You'll notice that overall percentage correct of classification is much lower than the last model. We had to sacrifice on this overall accuracy to decrease this number here. In the last model, we had 83 customers that were being classified as good credit risk when they were not. Now we have cut it almost in half to 44 customers. We have 85% accuracy in class two. Again, it's at the cost of classifying um, good customers as bad, but that's not as important to us in this problem. Another tab that's pretty common to look at here in CART is variable importance. This is a quick and easy way to look at which predictors are contributing to your model. Top variable is checking account. So this is whether a customer has a checking account and how much money is in it. We have purpose of the credit application, credit history, savings account, and so on. And so these are relative important scores to that top variable. So now that we have a good segmentation, we're happy that we've cut the number of incorrectly classified customers in half. We'll go back to our heart model, and we can look more at the tree. So for example, you can look at different nodes to see if you want to segment your customers in this way. So this first terminal node here is pretty blue. And when you hover over it, you can see that 96% of the cases in this node are class one. So those are good customers. There's 149 cases here. So how did these records fall into this node? To find out, you can click the node, and it brings up a distribution of the classes. We also have a rules tab that gives you the exact conditions for the variables that put the records in this node. So the customers had other credit history existing, no other installment, and they either had no checking account or a checking account with greater than or equal to 200 DM. And DM is a German currency. So all customers that met these conditions were classified as good credit risk. Now you might be wondering why someone with no checking account would be qualified as a good credit risk. And we've actually seen this in one of our other data sets too, that this might mean that a young adult whose parents are still paying their bills but they don't have a checking account would still be a good credit risk as long as their parents are paying off their cards. So on the other end of the spectrum, we can look at a dark red node. So let's look at terminal node 11 here. We can see that there's 457 records, and that 48% of those records are classified as bad credit risk. Now that's not the majority of this node, but it is much higher than the 30% that is in the original data set, which is why the node is so dark red in color. So again, we see the distribution of this node, and we can look at the rules. So here we see that the customer has less than 200 VM in their checking account, but a duration, which is credit history, at least greater than a year. But these are classified as bad credit risk. So even though more than half of this node were actually good credit risk, we had to sacrifice classifying them as bad in order to capture all of the actual bad credit risks in the group. So this tree here that we were given as optimal has 11 terminal nodes. This may be too many customer segments for you. And that's why we give the user the option of this modeling sequence in the bottom half. You can choose any tree you want and still do the summary statistics. And another cool feature 
is if you click this little graph button to the left, some of these blue squares in the sequence turn green. And these are trees that are within one standard deviation uh, in terms of relative cost of the optimal model. So you can come down here now, and you can say, well, the tree with five terminal nodes is within one standard deviation of the optimal tree. And maybe five segments is better for your um, application. So we're still getting some dark blue nodes and a dark red node here. Now, if you want to export the information on your segments, we can score this data. So I'll go back to our optimal tree here. And in the bottom right, we have a score button. And what this does is it runs all of your data through the model that you have selected. And when we save the scores, it will save the segmentation information. I'll save it as germancreditscore.csv. Just overwrite the existing file. And I'll check to save all model-related values. So this will have the segmentation information. Click Score. So we get score results. But what we really want to look at is the file that was created. So I'll open the CSV file in Excel. It contains a lot of information on uh, probabilities and all of the original variables. But the important column here is the third one, labeled node. And this has the number of the terminal node that the record fell in. So you have case by case and which customer segment each case fell in. This is an easy way to get a list of all the records and the customer segment that um, that record ended up in. If that tree is the one that you want to use, again, you can select a smaller tree. You can also adjust the parent and terminal node minimum cases to better get a tree that fits your application. So we're happy with our CART model. I'll go back to the slides. So I just have a summary here of what we saw in that last model, the customer segments. I pulled a few out. CART identified an 11-node tree with our low false good rate of only 44 customers. And I just summarized here terminal node 1, 8, and 11. So segment 1, or terminal node 1, had 96% good customers. They had credit history, no other installments, and either no checking account or a checking account with at least 200 DM. Our segment 8 here, which is prob which I think right here is this red node, is 45% of bad customers. They had no checking account or a checking account with at least 200 DM, but they had other installments and are using the credit line for business, education, or a car. And then finally, segment 11, dark red node on the right, is 48% bad. They had less than 200 DM in their checking account and have had credit history for at least a year. So these are just three examples of segments I pulled from this tree. Depending on your application, you might want to look at all of them or make a smaller tree. Okay, so we'll move on to some optimization. Using CART, to gain insights about your data, and then using TreeNet to boost accuracy is a typical modeling procedure that we use here and that tends to be successful on financial data sets. So TreeNet is also known as stochastic gradient boosting. TreeNet is just the name that we use in our software. And simply put, it's an ensemble of small cart trees. These cart trees are built in an error correcting sequence. So here's an illustration at the bottom. You can see we have, on the left, tree one is a small cart tree. There's only six terminal nodes. And that's about the typical size that we grow each tree in a tree net model. So you start with this small tree as your initial model. And you run your data through this tree and compute residuals for all of your records. Now you start 
the process by growing a second tree to predict the residuals from the first tree. You run all your records through this, compute residuals again, and predict those with tree three. You're doing this over and over again for a minimum of 200 trees. This is actually very fast. It sounds like it would be a lengthy process, but it runs extremely fast in the software, and it's extremely accurate. So our next step will be to build a tree net model. And we can use some of the same parameters we used in CART in our tree net model. I'll go ahead and minimize our second CART model. Go back to our model setup window. And all I have to do on this first tab is to switch the analysis method to TreeNet. As you can see here, we do have a lot of other engines that might interest you, Random Forest, Mars, Logit, uh, GPS. We'll choose TreeNet. Make sure our analysis type is still classification. And just double check here that the variables are still correctly selected. Again, we're using B-fold, 10-fold cross-validation. We can directly compare our tree net model to our cart model. In our tree net tab, we have some other control parameters specific to tree net. And the only one I'll change here is the number of trees we're building. As I mentioned before, we build a minimum of 200 trees. That's the default. But I will change this to 500. This is just because I know that we need 500 trees for this model. So typically, you would run with 200. And you would find out that you need to increase it. For time-saving purposes, I'll change it right to 500. Now, we still have our cost tab here, still 5 to 1. Keep that the same. But you'll notice that we don't have a priors tab here in TreeNet. Instead, we have class weight. It's the same idea. And by default, all class weights are equal. We want to change this. We want to change to balance. And as it says here, it's upweighting the smaller classes. So this is making it, making the model work harder to classify those bad credit risks. Okay, so I'll click start and we'll build our tree net model. So we're building 500 trees in each cross validation fold and you can see how fast this model is running. Okay, so this is our tree net output. We have the number of trees in our model, 500, plotted against our average log likelihood. Now to see our ROC value, a little quick summary, we can see that we're up to 0.78 on the test sample. So we've really boosted this number from the 0.71 in our last CART model. Additionally, we have a prediction success table. And I'll highlight this number. We're now down to 38 customers that are kind of sliding by as good credit risk when they're not. So this is down from the 44 we had in our CART model. So we've squeezed a little bit more accuracy out. Again, you can look at variable importance, see what your variables are doing. And that's a little bit more important here in this tree net model where you cannot see each individual tree as you can in CART because we have 500 trees in the model. Another cool feature of tree net that I'll just go through quickly here because we are running out of time is partial dependency plots. So I'll click create plot. I'm going to create 2D plots of all the variables. When I show these plots, they give a graph of each predictor against its contribution to bad credit risk. So it's just a good way to see how each predictor is behaving over all of its values and how that affects the credit risk.
for example, here in the bottom right, installment, as you have more installments, you're considered a better credit risk. We have to look up here to see which class that the engine is focusing on. Okay, so model results summary. We have the three models we built. We had our first cart model where we didn't adjust any parameters. And we got about 70% overall correct. But so we had 83 customers in that cell that I keep pointing out. Our second cart model, we adjusted the priors, the cost, and the node limits for an overall of 62%, but we knocked that number down almost in half to 44. And then finally, we had our TreeNet model where we were able to lower that false good customer rate down to 38. So now I'll just go over some of the case studies I mentioned at the beginning. That are This one is similar to what we just looked at. This is about customer retention. So an insurance company had information about their renewals for a year for their existing customers. So they had about 100,000 observations. And for them, that 100,000 was split into about 50% learn and 50% test samples. So they built the model on 50% of the data and tested on the other 50%. And this is something that you can do when you have a lot of data, such as 100,000 observations. And the renewal rate was at about 50%. So in this case, you wouldn't need to adjust the priors or costs because your classes are about equal. So they wanted to build a segmentation model to identify segments that were likely to renew. They had predictors such as gender, area, policy type, um, how competitive the current market was, the age of the customer. This next slide, we have the CART model from this case study. The prediction, prediction success table, you can see we had about 64% overall correct in the classes where evenly balanced, and we pulled out a few of the segments again to show you how, how well that cart uh, segmented the 50,000 customers. So it's a 12-node tree, and what this says here is there was good agreement on renewal rates between the learn and test partitions. That's what that graph is in the upper right. It's important if you have separate test partition that it behaves as the learn partition does. Otherwise, you might have some bias. So segment four, terminal node four in the cart tree, had 77% renewal rate. And these were customers that had at least an eight-year history, and the market intensity was low, so they were likely to renew. And again, these are the rules that were extracted from these cart nodes. In terminal node 11, we had 77% renewal as well. The market intensity was high in this case, but the customers were loyal. They had at least 11 years history with the company, and there was no significant premium increase, so they were likely to renew. And finally, terminal node 12 was a 27% renewal rate. So this is the lowest renewal rate in the tree. There was a significant premium increase for the customers, and the market conditions were intense. So the renewal rate was pretty low. So after the CART model, you run a TreeNet model to see if you can boost your accuracy. And in this case, a standard default TreeNet model only increased the accuracy about 1.19%, as you can see in the prediction success table. And there are a number of different parameters in TreeNet that you can play with, such as learn rate or number of trees to see if you can boost your model performance. You can play with the class weight. If you know that predicting renewal rate is harder than non-renewal rate. And again, you can use partial dependency plots to examine the underlying relationship. That's what I showed you at the end of that TreeNet run. Our next case study is a gym example. So, the original data is actually from a financial institution, and they wanted to disguise the data um, when they gave it to us. So it's disguised as a health club. 
and they wanted to understand the clustering scheme that was used on this data. So this is the post-segmentation approach that I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation. They already had 10 clusters of their customers, and they had somehow lost the clustering scheme or had no idea how the customers were put there. And so they wanted to look into these clusters and extract the rules under which the customers were grouped into the 10 different memberships. And so CART provided a nice way to kind of arrive at an intuitive story on how this happened. So this is the variable dictionary for this data set. There were about 100,000 records. There was a customer ID, which isn't useful, and cluster was the target variable. So it was 10 groups, 1 through 10, and we used the model to predict that cluster using things such as pool usage, racket ball usage, number of visits to the tanning salon. Again, these were disguised from a financial institution. So, for example, fitness score at the bottom of the list is probably something like credit score. So here's our CART model. We have pretty good performance, and that isn't surprising since there was an underlying structure um, previously put onto this data. You get a pretty big tree because you do have to incorporate all 10 classes. And since we know that these clusters exist, we're actually more interested in seeing which variables contribute to them. So we have our variable importance list there. And as you can see, the top most important variable is the fitness score, which is probably a credit score. Finally, we have our tree net model for this data. And this just boosts the accuracy a little more in predicting. We're up to 96%. And the important thing about tree net is that we can get those partial dependency plots to see exactly how the predictors were placing each customer of the gym into the specific membership group. So what we learned here, CART is a powerful tool for customer segmentation. It's a supervised analysis, meaning we had a target variable, but we do also have an unsupervised mode supported in the software. Priors and cost settings give us flexibility to adjust uh, different rates. Interaction detection was automatic, and missing value handling is also automatic, even though we didn't see that today. TreeNet boosts accuracy in most cases. Class weights allow us to set corresponding class rates, such as priors did for CART. And then dependency plots are also really important in looking at underlying relationships. A few advanced features I'll just touch on quickly. If any of them interest you, we'd be happy to show them to you. Hotspot detection is what you can do after you vary the priors in your model. You can identify the richest nodes in an ensemble. Predictor selection, we have automation techniques that can do automatic predictor shaving. What this does is it just builds the model over and over again, removing one variable at a time. And then finally, we have an engine called Rule Learner. And this builds an ensemble of trees and then extracts the most important rule set within nodes in the ensemble. So these are just different techniques for customer segmentation, some more advanced than others. Finally, we have a list of just some of the other applications that you can use um, these techniques for. So if any of these interest you or if you'd like any more information, please reach out to us and we can help you with your specific application. This is the paper and the data set that were referenced. And finally, we have about five minutes I can look at questions. But we will be sending out, again, I'll mention the follow-up email with the recording. Sometime tomorrow you will get it. And this will also have the slides, the data set, the tutorial, and instructions on how to download the software. And if I don't get to all the questions, I will be following up with you later today. OK, so I'll start looking at some of the questions.
So we have some questions about why we're just segmenting into two groups. And I think this is, I think you're confused about the target variable being two classes. We're actually segmenting into more than two groups. And the reason being is that sometimes there are different reasons for someone being a good credit risk or a bad credit risk. And these different reasons can create several different clusters of customers instead of just calling them good or bad credit risk. One question is, are these econometric models, i.e., y equals mx plus b? The answer is no, these are non-parametric models. So they cannot be um, described in a closed form, such as y equals mx plus b. This is also a classification problem. And y equals mx plus b is typically for regression, which is a continuous target. Instead, we were classifying people into good or bad. We have a question about the slides being available online. We will be sending them in the follow-up email that you will get tomorrow. Question on how to identify which node is most important. This is somewhat problem specific. It depends on what you're looking for. The nodes are color coded based on their richness. You might decide that the richest nodes are the most important and you can easily find that information by clicking on the nodes or just looking at the colors in the tree. You might also think nodes are most important um, for other reasons based on their rules. You might not want to have too many rules in a node. It's all um, data driven, so it will depend on the data you're putting into the model. Can I review the difference in the cost matrix and the class weight? So this is, again, that priors and cost trade-off. It's a little more complex than I can explain in the next couple of minutes. We will be sending out the slides, so you can review those slides. And if you still have questions, please feel free to send us a more detailed question on what exactly is confusing you, and we'll try and answer that for you. Another question is, how is priors and costs function implemented in TreeNet? The same priors and costs options for each tree or only for the first? Priors are actually only implemented in CART. TreeNet has its own um, implementation of class weights to weight the different classes of the target variable. As for the theory behind whether they're used for each tree or only for the first, I will have to get back to you on that question because I'm not sure. How are the partial dependency plots scaled? This is a good question. The partial dependency plots are actually an average of a family of curves, and then they're centered. So the vertical axis cannot be directly interpreted as it is pictured on the plot. They're centered at zero, so the um, increment of the change delta y is the only thing that you can really interpret from that plot. That is a little bit more of a complex question as well that we get a lot. So if you do need more resources on how to interpret partial dependency plots, we have papers on that and we can send those to you. How does TreeNet deal with missing values? Okay, TreeNet and CART deal with missing values differently. CART uses surrogates and TreeNet uses um, missing value indicators. So what happens is when you are splitting a tree, an entire node, a split will be whether a certain variable is missing or not. And then it will keep splitting down the node that is not missing. So it's handled a little differently because the feature of surrogates in CART can be very computationally expensive. And so when you're building an entire ensemble of trees, we cannot use surrogates for each tree. Okay, we're at 11 o'clock, so there are a few more questions that I will email you directly with the answers to. If you have any other questions, please email us at support at selfer-systems.com, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Look for the follow-up email tomorrow with all of the materials from the webinar today. Thank you for listening. <laughs>